Welcome back. Uh, we are now not just starting an entirely different chapter or module in single variable calculus. We're in fact starting a subject that typically isn't covered in as much depth as we're going to see here in single variable calculus. Basically, the selection of topics uh, was born out of the needs of the Integrated Engineering and Science curricula at Louisiana Tech University. Um, what we're going to talk about is statistics up to and including the central limit theorem, which is what tells you why you compute the standard error in a lab the way you do. Uh, some of what we're doing is a little bit compressed, and certainly if you want to know more about statistics, a separate statistics course is always a good idea. Uh, however, this uh, section of uh, this sequence of presentations will certainly give you uh, at least a working knowledge of the main terms that are being used in continuous statistics as well as, as I said before, an idea as to why we are computing errors in the lab the way we do. This first presentation uh, talks about discrete phenomena because uh, discrete statistics typically is a bit easier to understand and get into than the continuous statistics, but we will rapidly ramp up to talking about continuous phenomena because, after all, continuous phenomena are the realm of calculus. Discrete entities are typically not something that we mess with in calculus too much, and so we're going to uh, basically get an entrance into statistics and probability functions and the various terms that are related to that through discrete phenomena, but then we even at the end here, we're going to very quickly scale that to continuous probability or probability that is associated with continuous phenomena. All right, what are we interested in? Well, we want to connect mathematics to probability. And in order to do that, we need a formalism because after all, mathematics by itself is not about chance. Mathematical theorems are being proved. They are being derived correctly from accepted axioms. And so mathematical theorems aren't just true 99% of the time. Mathematical theorems are true all the time. And so basically we need some form formalism that connects these two uh, previously somewhat antagonistic ideas, right? And uh, we also need a bit of a feel for randomness, for how randomness can influence real life events. And therefore, the natural starting point for probability in a lot of ways really is that we're going to talk about games of chance. The main focus in calculus-based statistics is on continuous phenomena, as I already said. And so we will consider the discrete phenomena only in this presentation. So let's take a look. A sample space is the set of all possible outcomes of an experiment that is influenced by randomness. Okay, so here we have a wonderful mathematical definition. Um, the sentence is supposed to make sense, but you really don't have a feel for what that is. So let's take a look at it in a real scenario, such as a coin flip. The sample space for a coin flip is, well, there are two outcomes, heads and tails. So here's heads, here's tails, and that's the sample space for a coin flip, right? You flip a coin, you've got two possible outcomes, you collect them all, and what you get is the sample space. I uh, like to put a disclaimer in right here because some people really don't like games of chance and I can understand that because certainly there are unfortunate individuals who have become, are becoming and unfortunately also will become addicted to these games and potentially ruin themselves as well as their families. Um, the examples are meant to get us to understand randomness in games of chance and the understanding of a game of chance does not imply its endorsement, so I think the farthest I would lean out the window would be to say, play at your own risk. In many ways, actually, once you understand how certain games of chance work, you get a pretty good idea that you should stay away from them because the deck is stacked against you. We're going to see that in the next example, I think. Uh, so, sample spaces, okay, not the next example, but we'll talk about roulette a little bit, and that that's just a... Uh, a perfectly valid example where everything is legal and yet the deck is stacked against you. Okay, so if you flip three coins in a row, if you do something like a best of three in a game of chance, well, 
what would that be? The sample space would be, you could have all heads. You could have first two heads and then a tail. You could have a head, then a tail, then a head. You could have a head and two tails. You could have a tail, a head, and a head. You could have a tail, a head, and a tail. A tail, a tail, and a head. And you could also have three tails. So you've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight possible outcomes. And one of the challenges in discrete probability is that you need to be able to envision these kinds of sample spaces and literally count the outcomes in order to compute probabilities. We'll have a few examples of that, certainly, and also a couple of homework problems. But in the end, this is one of those parts of mathematics where the understanding is non-deterministic. There isn't much I can say in general that would, that would tell you this is how you always figure out a sample space. Okay, so let's take a look at sample space for a spin of the roulette wheel. Well, the sample space would be the set of numbers from 1 to 36 plus 0 and in the United States also a double zero. And basically, if you have never seen a roulette table, here's a picture that I drew of a roulette setup. It's got the numbers from 1 through 36 as well as 0 and double zero. And uh, you can put chips on any single number. You can bet that the numbers in the first, second, third dozen. You could bet that the numbers in the first column, second column, third column. You could bet that the numbers between 1 and 18 or between 19 and 36. You could bet that the number is even or the number is odd. Or you can bet that the number is red or black. And you will have various payoffs on that. There are also certain ways to put chips on four numbers or six numbers. Uh, and then you're just betting that the number is among those. Um, but the key to the roulette uh, game for casinos is that zero and double zero are not in any of these categories, which means there is ultimately, as long as you bid on categories, they are also not in any of the columns here, there is always a certain chance that you would end up with zero or double zero, which erases all the bets that are here in these categories. Okay, so what's the definition of an event now? An event is a subset of a sample space. And yeah, that is something that feels kind of strange, right? I mean, we've, we've just made friends with the idea that a sample space is the set of all possible things that could happen. That's, that's perfectly fine, right? A uh, sample space for, for playing the lottery is all possible com combinations of numbers that come out of a lottery drawing. Uh, but then an event is a subset of a sample space. See, we're talking about sets here. An event suggests that something is happening or has happened, and that that definition isn't really a happening thing. I mean, there's what, what what's going on there? So one way to think of that is that the actual event, when you're talking about real life, the stuff that actually happens, and of course there's always something happening that you're trying to model, that what actually happened is that the outcome was in the set that we call the event. That's, that's the most sense I could make out of the language, and I... I it, it works pretty well, I think. So, for example, the event tails, 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 heads, tails, head, tails, head, tails, tails has happened if and only if we got at least two tails in three flips of a coin. So you can also see how events can be encoded similarly. If you are playing to, to break a tie or to, I don't know, um, figure out which team kicks off first in a game or so, and you actually want to do this with t uh, best two out of three coin flips and your side has uh, picked tails, then of course you win if you've got at least two tails in the three flips of a coin. And here are all the possibilities in which you can get two tails in three flips of a coin. Uh, the event A equals even numbers has happened if and only if the ball on the roulette wheel, the numbers from 1 through 36 plus 0 and double zero, are picked by a ball that goes into a slot on a wheel. Uh, so if the ball on the roulette wheel comes to rest in a slot that corresponds to an even number, let's be careful here that zero and double zero, neither one of those counts as even in roulette. Okay, so two events that do not intersect. You see, now we on one hand we have stuff that, that happens, those are the events, but we've translated these things into sets, and sets can intersect. And two events that do not intersect are called mutually exclusive or disjoint, right? If you have three coin flips, you can't have two heads and two tails. Well, wait, 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 that's, uh, that, that's, yeah, that is mutually exclusive or disjoint. Um, so 
That is where if we were to draw these things as sets, the sets wouldn't have any elements in common. And uh, in terms of real life situations, it would mean that the two things can't happen at the same time. Two mutually exclusive events whose union is the whole sample space, those things are called complementary, and we're going to have some examples as to what complementary events are, I think. So, whoop, no, we don't. Okay, so complementary events, heads and tails are complementary, right? The sample space of one coin flip, heads, tails, that's it. Uh, for three coin flips, no matter what you do, in every set of three coin flips, you will have at least two heads or at least two tails. And that makes up the whole sample space, and at the same time, we don't have anything that is in common between the two. So complementary events are something that encompass everything that happens without overlapping. And so now what we want to do is we want to assign probability to these things. And so what is a sensible probability function? Probability should be scaled to a certain range. And it is customary that probabilities are z values between 0 and 1 or between 0% or 100%. That is the scaling. 0% is something that is virtually impossible for the probability. 100% is something that is virtually certain. And yeah, so 0 is the lowest possible probability and 1 is the highest. And so in particular, that means there is no 110% guarantee that your team will win the next game. No matter what coach says, that is just not possible. I know if you're really favoring a certain team, you want to have those kinds of guarantees, but you can't even give a 100% guarantee on the future unless it is something that will happen, namely your team will win or lose, or tie, if you're playing a game in which ties are possible. Uh, but there is no such thing as a 100% prob 110% probability. Probability should also be additive. So that means if I try twice to achieve a certain outcome, my chances should double. So for example, if I buy two lottery tickets, and for some specialists, I probably also have to say, yeah, they ought to have different numbers, right? So if I buy two lottery tickets with different numbers, that will double my odds of winning the lottery. The arteries will, the arteries, the odds, <laughs> the odds will still be terribly low, but they'll be twice of what they were before. Ah, uh, yeah, chances are small, but still twice as what they were. Okay, so now what is a probability function? A probability function takes every event of our sample space, anything that could possibly happen, and it assigns to this event a probability. And it does so in the following way. Every event has a probability that is greater or equal than zero. If the event is impossible, it gets probability zero. Otherwise, it gets certain odds associated with the event. So, for example, if I flip a coin, the event that the coin comes down and stands on edge typically is assigned the probability of zero because people just rarely have that happen. And I think if you want to be really technical about it, you just have to design a coin so that doesn't happen, like a coin that has a sharp edge or so. Um, the probability of the whole sample space, the probability of all the events together is one. That basically says it is 100% sure that something will happen, right? Your team will win, lose, or tie. We know what we want, but we know that the probabilities are win, loss, or tie. Uh, and then for all disjoint events, ENF, we have that the probability of the union of the two events is just the sum of the individual probabilities where the union denotes the union of sets. So basically what that means is if you're playing a game where there could be a win, a loss, or a tie, and suppose they're all equally likely, well, then the probability of a win or a tie, which are the favorable outcome for your team, would be one-third plus one-third, with the last third, the loss, uh, being gone. So that means that you don't get any additional chances when you're just adding disjoint, ev uh, disjoint events, and you're also not losing any probability. Okay, so then very often, uh, at least in the elementary examples, reasonable assumptions can be used to determine the probability. So, For example, for a coin flip, we assume that either outcome is equally likely. So the probability of a head is one half, and the probability of a tail is one half, assuming that you have what is called a fair coin. Uh, assuming the fair coin there. And so there are tests that can be performed on long-term data to verify whether this is really true, and I think there is a way to do coin flips with 
uh, pennies with United States one cent pieces where you you just stand them all up on edge on a table and then you hit the table to make them topple over where actually one outcome is more likely than the other because of the way the imprinting on the coin weights the coin and makes it more likely to fall over to one side. So if you really want to mess with people you could do coin flips like that and uh, yeah okay don't assume that I just told you or encouraged you how to cheat uh, but this is how sometimes then also in legal fashions games of chance are set up to uh, make the impression that they are not biased against you whereas in fact there are they are and companies are very open about that because for example for roulette every outcome is equally likely so the outcome that you can get any number here is 1 over 38 because you've got 38 numbers the way casinos make money is that the payoffs are based on 36 numbers and there are, there are certain ways that there are only so many ways you can bet on zero and on double zero we're going to come back to that as we're talking about expected values and I should also say here in a similar disclaimer if you want to go to a casino that is your choice I have gone to a casino before too I have always made it a promise to myself that I wouldn't uh, gamble a lot of money I never have I don't endorse that um, but basically it's, it's legal activity if it's legal activity in your state basically you what what's it called you you pays your money you takes your chances okay so the simplest probability function we can have for a sample space with n elements is that we just assign to every single n event x the probability 1 over n and to each event with k possibilities the probability k over n that is in fact what happens in coin flips probabilities one half that is what happens in roulette the probability is 1 over 38 and, and I think this is something that uh, gaming, the gaming industry will also insist on the roulette wheel is balanced in such a way that it is supposed to be a uniform distribution in these outcomes. Uh, and so this is called the discrete uniform probability function. Now let's talk about random variables because here is where things really start getting interesting for us. A discrete random variable is a real valued function whose domain is a sample space. Oh my goodness. Well that's that's getting horribly abstract. So let, let's think about that again. The domain is a sample space, so the sample space is all the stuff that can happen. And now to anything we have and we assign another real number. And uh, basically that real number that we assign is something like the payoff. If you bet on the number 5 in roulette, what is your payoff going to be if you bet $1? Answer $36 if you win. Otherwise, of course, you lose that one dollar. So it's now not just that we have assigned probabilities, we potentially also assign things like payoffs to this data and we're going to see that as we talk about expected values. Now for a given parameter p, ay, 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 ay. so parameter p basically you want to think of this as your probability of winning. The Bernoulli distribution with parameter p for a random variable that gives you values 0 and 1, 0 you lose, 1 you win, is given by probability of x equal 1, probability of winning being p, probability of losing being 1 minus p being just the opposite. Okay, so as an example, well, Bernoulli random variables, okay, we talked about winning and losing and stuff like that, but there are very important industrial applications that also are governed by this distribution because if you have a piece of equipment in a shop or in a factory, that piece of equipment either works or it doesn't. Now, equipment has gotten a lot better and a lot more reliable even in the time that I have been alive which isn't that long yet but uh, there is always a chance that a piece of equipment could potentially fail there's always a chance that you have a flat tire today there's always a chance that your battery on your car is run out and your car doesn't start and so on and so on so we are not even though the visualization with games of chance is very nice we're not just talking about games of chance this is something that industrial people are very much concerned with because this is the probability that you need repairs and so on and so on. In a game of chance you either win or you don't and if you're looking at insurance which is a huge application of probability and uh, when you have an insurance you either collect on the insurance or you do not and typically even though insurance payouts look like large amounts of money typically you don't 
want to collect on insurance. For example, I carry medical insurance for my family, which is really good because if something bad happens, the medical insurance will hopefully take care of things for us. But I really, I don't want to collect large sums out of my medical insurance because the only way I can collect large sums out of my me medical insurance is to get really, really sick. And uh, no, I have very little motivation to get that, right? So um, what insurance companies that are interested in, what the gaming industry is interested in, and also what industry is interested in when it comes to um, when it comes to equipment is we are interested in the center of the distribution and the expected long-term average of what is going to happen in a game of chance in insurance payouts and with equipment how much repair costs you will have in the long run. Okay, so basically one way to interpret probability is that over a large number of trials, like many people playing roulette, like many people buying insurance, like many pieces of equipment being used in a variety of settings like batteries in cars, the proportion of favorable outcomes or the proportion of outcomes that are associated with a one is approximately the probability of that favorable outcome. So if I have a 50% chance of winning a coin flip, if we do 500 coin flips, then it's about assumed that I'll win roughly 500 times and lose 500 times. Not exactly that, but it, it ought to balance out around that area. Similarly, if 1 million cars have uh, the same battery built in and there is a 0.01 chance of failure for that battery, then you take your 1 million and you divide by 10,000 and you end up with about 100 batteries expected to fail within a certain amount of time. And similarly, insurances, also medical insurance, will have long-term data that indicates how many people will need what kinds of treatment, and they base their rates on that. So if I look at roulette, if I play roulette for a long time, what do I get? If I always bet $1 on even, then I will $1 about 18 out of 38 times. So that's 9 out of 19. That's 47.4% of the time, because when you bet $1 on even and you win, you just win another dollar, in other words, you lose. And so that means I will lose my dollar about 20 over 38, which is 10 over 19, or 52.6% of the time. And this is, and this is perfectly legal, and it's not something that the gaming industry will ever dispute, which is why there is also always the disclaimer that it's entertainment only. The deck is stacked against you. If you play roulette, you can expect to lose more often than you win. And if you look at all the roulette payoffs, there's always a slightly better chance for the house to win than for you. Uh, so that also means then, in the long run, if I play a thousand games, I can expect to win about 474 times and lose about 526 times. Not exactly. It is possible that I win more than 500 times, but it's unlikely. It is possible that the house win five, wins 550 times, which is also unlikely, but the house will win around 526 times, the house will win more often than it does not. That's how these places uh, stay in business. And there's nothing wrong with keeping people in business as long as you know what the business is that they are in and as long as the business is legal. Okay, so the net change in my wealth would be $52 that I would lose. And, well, so this idea now scales to in games. So if I can expect to win, I mean, basically on the previous panel we had very nice numbers. If I look at end games, I can expect to win about 9 over 19 times end games, and I can expect to lose 10 over 19 times end games. And that net change in my wealth, always assuming that I'm betting $1, uh, would be about 9 nineteenths n minus 10 nineteenths over n, so I would, I would lose 1 nineteenth n, so I would lose 5.2% of, of the n dollars that I have been betting in, in these end games. And so if we divide out the n, we obtain the expected net change per game, right? If I have negative 0 0.052 n as my net change, then if I divide out the n, my net expected net change per game is negative 1 19th of a dollar. So here it is a little bit challenging because as long as you bet whole dollar amount, amounts, 
there's no way you're going to lose one nineteenth of a dollar in one game. If you bid 19 whole dollars, you're not going to lose one dollar because you either lose them all or you double them if you bet on even. Uh, but so that's that's then sort of a, a per game average. That per game average need not be assumed in every game, but it is a per game average. And so by multiplying each value of a random variable with its probability and adding the results, we basically get an expected or average per trial value of the random variable. And so the definition that goes with that is that the expected value or mean of a discrete random variable is the sum of the products of the outcomes with the associated probabilities. And so that is, if the outcomes are x1 through xn, then the expected value of x is the sum over all the possible outcomes. You take your xk and you multiply with the probability that x is equal to xk. Example, for a Bernoulli random variable x with success probability p, we have that the expected value is 1 times p, right? The outcome 1 times the success probability p plus the outcome 0 times the failure probability 1 minus p. So the expected value of a Bernoulli random variable is p. Okay, so the expected long-term results of betting on even and roulette, the random variable here now would be that uh, if the number that comes up is n, then the outcome for an even number is that you gain $1, because for a dollar bet, you get another dollar back. If the number comes being that comes as odd or as zero or double zero, then you lose your dollar, so your net outcome is negative one. Probability of one is nine over 19, as we already talked about. There are 18 even numbers. The probability of losing the dollar is 20 over 38, as we've talked about. There are 18 odd numbers, plus zero and double zero. And so the expected value then is one times nine over 19, plus negative one times 10 over 19, which is negative one nineteenth, which is in the expected value scenario, exactly this discussion that we had earlier with exactly the same numbers, that the expected value gives you a per game average of what your random variable will return, or per trial average. Now, let's look at continuous probability. Uh, let me say right here that this is a very fast introduction to probability. Typically in a statistics class, you will spend about uh, two or three weeks even on discrete probability on various uh, details and, and, and certainly lots of good examples in discrete probability that'll get you used to thinking about probabilities in terms of probability functions and so on. We are here within the confines of a calculus course that is not meant to incorporate a full statistics course so we're now rapidly ramping up and we're going to take a look at continuous probability and in fact the next probability presentation already will talk about the situation of what happens when you have continuous outcomes. So take a look at a random variable y and that random variable y is supposed to be the number of successes in n, rand, n independent Bernoulli trials with success probability p. So this is something like you have your car for 100 days, what is my probability that the car will start every single day so the battery doesn't work out and things doesn't break or things like that. Then the probability that your number of successes in n trials is y is total number of trials. Choose number of successes. This is a binomial coefficient. We'll write down what the binomial coefficient is again uh, below here as we prove this thing. Then you have your success probability raised to y and your failure probability raised to n minus y, which somehow makes sense, right? y successes should be y times you've got probability p, n minus y failures would mean that n minus y times you've got probability n minus y, uh, n 1 minus p to n minus y. And this probability distribution is also called the binomial distribution with parameters n and p. Don't worry too much about the vocabulary here. The vocabulary up to now is standard vocabulary. We will see it again, but this is now just very specific. I think we're only going to see it here or in this section. Proof. Well, the probability of an individual sequence of y successes and n minus y failures is p to the y, 1 minus p to the n minus y. Because if you're looking at any sequence of zeros and ones, the probability of every one is a p, the probability of every zero is an n minus p, and so the probability of the whole sequence is a product of p's and 1 minus p's, and you've got, if you've got y successes, you will have y p's and 
n minus y1 minus p's, and because these are repeated trials, those probabilities multiply with each other, right? The probability of having tails, tails in coin flips is one half times one half equals one fourth, for example. Okay, so now how do we get the n choose k? We need to look at the number of distinct ways to arrange y successes and n minus y failures, because after all, we don't care how we get the n, the y successes and the n minus y failures here, we just care about the aggregates. And so, for example, as we have also seen earlier on, there are four ways to get at least two tails, I think we talked about, at least two tails in three coin flips, which are a typical Bernoulli exp experiment. And so, how do we work that out? Well, we have n factorial over n minus y factorials. Basically, that is the product n times n minus 1 times n minus 2 times all the way through n minus y plus 1. And that's basically because if you were to put your successes, your y successes into n slots, you've got n slots for the first one, you've got n minus 1 slots for the second one, and so on, all the way down to n minus y plus 1 slots for the last one to place, because of course you can't put two successes at the same time, because this is uh, staggered in time. And so that gives you n factorial over n minus y factorial. And we have to divide by y factorial because these y successes that we have are not distinguishable from each other. Everything is, every each one of them is the same type of experiment. So the order in which we fill these slots doesn't matter. So we have to divide out an additional y factorial here. And so that means this is n choose y. And so the probability for y successes and n minus y failures is, because all of these things are additive, the probability of y successes and n minus y failures is n choose y, because they're all distinct events, times the probabilities of the individual events, and that's what we've been saying here. Okay, so that's still games of chance. How does that connect to something that is continuous? Well, the typical continuous variable that we're facing on a daily basis is time. And one of the standard examples for this kind of thing are waiting times. And so let's take a look at waiting times. The probability of an event happening in an interval of length t typically is t over theta, where theta tells us something about how likely this thing is to happen in a certain time frame. And then, similar to what we had before, the longer you wait, the larger your probability will be. Well, that doesn't quite work out here because ultimately, um, if the interval is too long, the in, in, um, if it exceeds the theta, we would have a problem here. So for short time, we also want to have that t is ultimately shorter than theta. For short time intervals, the probability of two events in the same time interval is supposed to go to zero. Basically, we don't want events to be staggered too closely to each other. And with a tight enough time scale, we could actually make that happen. And we want to have that the probability to wait longer than t time units is the probability of no event in the interval from 0 to t. And so if we now take our uh, interval 0 to t and partition that into n short intervals, well, then the probability of no event in the interval from 0 to t is approximately the probability of no success in n Bernoulli trials with success probability t over n over theta. So here's where a little bit of magic happens because now things are no longer additive. If I make my n large enough, I will always get individual probabilities that are smaller than 1, and that's good because now in the transition to a, dis to a continuous random variable, we, sell, we say, okay, the probability that nothing happens is 1 minus t over n of theta. So, right, the probability that something happens is t over n minus theta, so the probability that nothing happens is 1 minus t over n over theta. And we have n intervals, so this is we do this n times, just like we had in the variable previously. And, uh, well, n choose 0 is 1, so we don't have the uh, binomial coefficient out front. And now this is a standard limit that we've also messed with in calculus when we talked about L'Hopital's rule, so this is something that you can work out with L'Hopital's rule if you wish, but the limit as n goes to infinity of, if I put the n on the bottom and the theta up top, I get 1 minus t over theta divided by n quantity raised to the n. That limit as n goes to infinity is e to the negative t over theta, and that is always a number that is 
smaller than 1. So that means that basically um, as t goes to infinity, my probability that nothing happens is 0. Basically, if you keep the same tire on your car and you run it and you run it and you run it, even though you don't want that tire to break, ultimately it will. It's just there. there's nothing we can do about it. The thing isn't going to stand up forever. Uh, at the same time, we can also see that for short time intervals, um, e to the negative 0, e to the 0 is 1. And so for intervals where t is small enough so that this is around 1, you have a pretty good chance that nothing happens to your tire, which is, of course, why we buy new tires and then hope that these tires will last us for at least a certain amount of time. And so this part here is what we're ultimately in the continuous probability are going to talk about for waiting time distributions. What you should have taken out of this presentation is a general idea that we can use mathematical formulas in order to describe events that are actually influenced by randomness. We have the vocabulary about sample spaces, probability functions, random variables, and so on. Uh, you should take out of this presentation that random variables can be used to describe events, to describe costs, to describe things that are related to randomness. And you should take out of this presentation that the expected value is something like where a distribution is centered. And what we're going to do as we move on, now you're going to do a few homework problems that will hopefully still be intuitive because the point here is not to go deep into the analysis of discrete processes, but to just give us an idea what probability is. So I hope you will work these homework problems reasonably well and find them intuitive. And in the next presentation, we are already going to talk about probability functions for events that are described by a continuum of numbers. So by numbers such as a time, which is not just limited to numbers like 1 through 36, but that could also have values in between, between like 47 over 32 and so on. All right, I'll see you there.